Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Collins and I'm the Director General of the IIEA, the Institute of International and European Affairs. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you this lunchtime to our latest webinar, which is a public event as part of our Future of the EU 27 project. This project is supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Many of the very large numbers joining us today have attended previous webinars we have hosted and are familiar with the work of the IIEA. But a particular welcome also to those of you who might be joining an IIE webinar for the first time. We hope that through these events, we can provide greater insight and understanding of the important issues and policies affecting and shaping Ireland and the world around us. Tomorrow, the 9th of May, is Europe Day 2020, a Europe Day like no other in living memory. So today we are particularly delighted to welcome the Tonished and Minister of Foreign Affairs, Simon Coveney, whose address, Marking Europe Day 2020, will focus on the many challenges now facing the European Union as it comes to grips with the wide-ranging implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Tonished will speak to you for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll open up to take your questions. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. We will not be taking questions through the chat function, so please limit your questions to the Q&A function on your screen. A reminder that this discussion is fully on the record, both the Tonish's initial remarks and the subsequent Q&A. A further reminder that you can join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And with that, and without the need for further introduction, I would hand you over to the Tonishta and Minister for Foreign Affairs, Simon Coveney. Tonishta, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Michael. And uh, first of all, a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, thanks for taking the time to be with us today, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, I'd like to begin, though, by thanking the IIEA for inviting me to speak today and to all participants for logging in in such large numbers. The current circumstances, of course, mean that we can't hold these events in person, for now at least. Uh, but I commend the IIEA's hard work and innovation in continuing to deliver an, an ambitious uh, program uh, of events. Uh, they're always informative. Uh, we're getting used to working differently. Uh, and I, I am um, somebody who hardly even heard of Zoom uh, a few weeks ago, uh, but now I'm using it virtually every day, uh, not just to speak to um, the people like the people watching today, but also to my children as well. Um, tomorrow we mark Europe Day, uh, 70 years since Robert Schuman first set out his vision of a peaceful and united Europe. We've come a long way since Schumann first presented his proposals for a European coal and steel community. Schumann delivered his speech just five years after the end of the Second World War and against a backdrop of the Cold War. Schumann's primary concern at the time was to prevent another war tearing, tearing through Western Europe. Uh, as the lived memories of the survivors of that era uh, pass with age, we must grasp the responsibility of energizing his legacy with renewed commitment to peace, solidarity, and respect for the rule of law. The solidarity and unity between European states that's often taken for granted today was hard fought over many years. Europe Day provides a timely opportunity each year to acknowledge and recommit to this achievement. On Europe Day, we should also reflect on the Europe as we see it, on the European Union as we see it today. Red Sea and EMI carry out a poll around this time each year, which gives us a useful snapshot of the attitudes of Irish people to the EU and its policies. This year's poll was carried out at the end of March, just as the coronavirus uh, took hold across the continent, and as the Union, uh, like its member states, struggled to respond quickly enough to the new realities. While the result of the poll should be understood in that context, it is of course disappointing to see support for Ireland's membership of the EU fall to 84% this year from a high of 93% last year. Uh, the portion of people answering don't know uh, on whether they agree with EU membership rose to 9% up from 2%. I think it's important to look at the context there of last year being an extraordinary high in terms of numbers, but still we shouldn't ignore trends. While these figures show higher support for EU membership in Ireland than in any other EU member state, they are nonetheless a reminder that support for the Union in this country should never be taken for granted. 
we must and can do more to enhance the debate uh, that we have in Ireland about our membership of the European Union and our aspirations for the future. Let me talk a bit about the EU's response to COVID-19 first. While the Union has taken unprecedented measures in support of member states, most Europeans have looked to the nation state to protect and guide them through this current crisis. The EU has been perceived as somewhat peripheral to the key decisions relating to the domestic medical response, lockdown and reopening of societies that's gonna happen over time. But recovery and economic recovery in particular will depend on EU solidarity and decisive swift action. Thousands of businesses and millions of jobs would be lost were it not for the financial support facilitated by the EU and the ECB. It would be fair to say that at the beginning of the crisis, the EU struggled to communicate the comprehensive nature of its response. Some of its initial hesitancy uh, can be explained by the fact uh, that health is a national competence and it's not shared at, at EU level. But also I think it can be explained by just the sheer pace of the spread of this virus and the impact that it was having on people's lives. Understandably, member states activated their own emergency planning uh, to prepare their health systems for the onslaught of the coronavirus, first in Italy and then as the virus spread across the Union. And some initial responses, such as closing borders, uh, were taken perhaps uh, in an uncoordinated manner, adding to the negative perceptions uh, of the collective EU response. But the truth is that the EU is carrying out a series of unprecedented measures to address the health and socio-economic consequences of this virus. For example, to counteract the problem caused by border closures, the Commission worked immediately with member states to create what were called green lanes, which removed cross-border blockages, hindering the free movement of people and goods and keeping supply chains open. Um, that was a difficult enough process actually to deliver. Uh, but for a country like Ireland, it was absolutely essential uh, in terms of supply chains. Uh, it's also uh, provided guidelines for border management measures to protect citizens' health uh, while preserving the integrity of the single market. Ensuring the availability of goods and essential services uh, is of vital importance to all of us, but particularly an exporting country like Ireland. Also vital is research on the coronavirus, which will help to develop much needed vaccines and treatments, neither of which exist today. The European Commission very quickly announced a fund of just under 50 million euros from Horizon 2020 uh, fund projects, um, including one which uh, uh, is coordinated by a, an Irish company, um, Hybergene uh, Diagnostics. The EU also set up joint procurement processes for EU member states to help provide quicker access to vital medical equipment and to personal protective equipment. The term PPE is, is a term that every household is now familiar with in Ireland. Um, an individual uh, European and individual European countries uh, have assisted each other, of course. Uh, for example, uh, French patients being treated in German hospitals. Uh, we also have arrangements with a number of German laboratories uh, in terms of getting tests uh, done quickly uh, to uh, dramatically actually improve uh, both turnaround times and the number uh, of, uh, of tests uh, that we can turn over uh, each day. At the same time, the EU has tackled the economic crisis provoked by the, uh, by the pandemic. On the 18th of March, uh, ECB President Lagarde announced a, a 750 billion euro response to the pandemic. The ECB Pandemic Emergency Purchase Programme is a temporary asset purchase program for private and public uh, sector securities, uh, which aims to ensure that all sectors of the economy can benefit from supportive financing conditions that enable them to absorb this shock. This applies equally uh, to families, firms, banks, and of course, governments. Two days later, the Commission responded, uh, sorry, two days later, the Commission proposed the activation of the General Escape Clause of the Stability and growth pact, although I think that was simply a recognition of reality when that happened. This allows member states though to take measures to deal with the crisis while departing from the budgetary requirements that would normally apply under the fiscal framework and the fiscal rules. For Ireland, 
the EU has approved two separate uh, state aid packages worth about 400 million in total, uh, which allows us to support our affected companies through the pandemic. Through these financial measures, the EU state aid approval uh, and EU state aid approval, uh, we can make sure that support reaches those who have lost their jobs uh, because of the crisis. Uh, and this is going to continue for quite some time. Following intensive work by the Eurogroup throughout April, EU leaders agreed a crisis response package of 540 billion euros. These are enormous numbers, but they're necessary. The, uh, the initiatives outlined under this package uh, are due to be operational by the 1st of June. They'll be vital to helping us to, uh, they'll be vital in helping us to support our businesses who've been impacted by the pandemic, uh, as well as workers who've lost their jobs or require uh, temporary income supports. Most importantly, these measures show the solidarity and support uh, for innovation that is needed to devise an unprecedented response to an unprecedented crisis. Work is also ongoing uh, for an EU recovery fund. Uh, while the Commission is revising its proposal uh, for the EU's budget uh, to support programmes designed uh, to kickstart the economy. Again, these measures will ensure EU solidarity uh, with the most affected member states. Uh, one of the core roles of my department, uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, is consular work. Uh, that is supporting and assisting our citizens all over the world. Uh, at no time has this been more important all around the world than during this COVID-19 crisis. Since the outbreak of the virus, my department has advised and assisted many thousands of Irish citizens overseas, uh, over 5,000 uh, in fact, uh, helping them to get home. What started as a country specific situation rapidly evolved into a coordination uh, of the biggest repatriation effort in the history of the state. Uh, cooperation with other EU member states and like-minded partners uh, has been a crucial factor uh, to actually make an awful lot of that rep repatriation happen in practice. The sharing of information, the coordination of action with EU partners has been an enormous strength. Uh, whether through sharing flights, information or resources, we have been far more effective and better able to support our citizens by working together. EU coordination efforts have ensured that EU citizens can avail of places on repatriation flights organized by individual member states. I'm delighted that Ireland has already been able to charter two special flights, one from, one from Peru and one from India. We have a number of others on the way. Uh, and we have uh, repatriated citizens uh, from a number of other EU countries in the UK on those flights, as you would expect. Uh, Irish citizens, 627 of them to date, have been repatriated on special flights from 126 different locations organized by other partners, making use of the uh, union's civil protection mechanism, which effectively gives uh, about 75% uh, of the cost back uh, to the state uh, in terms of the cost of, uh, of repatriation flights. We have protected our citizens abroad to an extent that would not have been possible if we weren't a member of the European Union. The Union has made a concrete difference uh, for our citizens' lives and our health uh, and continues to do so. We continue to work closely uh, with partner EU member states, uh, as well as with our British friends, uh, the US, Canada and others, as we support and assist Irish citizens overseas. So let me also take this opportunity to note the cooperation we've received from airlines and the aviation industry, which has been hugely positive, uh, which have played a crucial role uh, in helping us to get to some very difficult places uh, under very difficult uh, conditions. It's becoming increasingly clear uh, that only a global effort will contain and minimize the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic until a vaccination can be developed and rolled out globally. As Dr. Mike Ryan of the WHO has said, no one is safe uh, until everybody is safe. The EU is playing a lead role in the fight against the pandemic. Uh, on Monday of this week, uh, President von der Leyen co-hosted a coronavirus global response, response pledging conference, which raised 7.4 billion euros uh, for global efforts to, to, to defeat this virus. Pledging 18 million on the part of Ireland, the Taoiseach said on Monday that the virus did not respect borders and COVID-19 is a shared enemy of all of humanity and all governments. On the 8th of April, uh, EU development ministers endorsed the Team Europe package of support for partner countries. 
The EU will also help the most vulnerable countries, particularly in Africa and the EU's neighbourhood and uh, further afield where necessary. Total uh, financial support for this EU collective action from the Commission and the EIB will amount to over uh, 15 and a half billion euros. Combined with contributions from member states individually, the total amount is expected to reach over 20 billion euros. At a time when there has been a move by some countries away from the principles of multilateralism uh, and towards nationalism, the pandemic has shown uh, how we all suffer if we fail to work together. Uh, it is right that the European Union is now trying to show global leadership uh, as well as leadership for its own citizens uh, in the face uh, of such a pandemic. Although the start of the crisis was marked uh, with some uncertainty and perhaps incoherence, uh, I'm very hopeful uh, that during the ease, easing of restrictions across Europe, uh, we will see an awful lot more coordination this time round. The EU has developed a joint uh, European roadmap towards lifting COVID-19. Uh, containment measures uh, uh, to help uh, strategically plan uh, and recover uh, are in place. While, it is, well, while it's, of course, for member states to make their own decisions about the timing and scope of removing restrictions uh, based on their own circumstances uh, and based on their own public health advice, it is helpful for EU institutions to work on a coordinated approach with member states. Many other European countries have published staged action plans similar to our own, uh, and we have much to learn uh, from each other's experiences as they ease restrictions in different sectors. Um, the extent of this emergency is new to everybody, uh, and we're learning as we go. However, it's important to recognize also that member states are at different points uh, in the pandemic. Uh, and the vital message to citizens is that we must continue to slow the spread of this virus and not ease up on those efforts. Uh, although the COVID-19 emergency has rightfully dominated our politics uh, for the last few months, uh, as indeed it's dominated people's lives, we must remain focused on other key priorities too, including the EU's ongoing negotiations with the UK on its future relationship with the UN, because time is moving on and the Brexit challenges have not gone away. Ireland is working as part of the EU27 to ensure that our collective approach to the future relationship negotiations re reflects our values and our interests. To date, we've had two full negotiating rounds uh, and a number of more technical exchanges. For Ireland, uh, alongside a free trade agreement in goods, uh, with a level playing field for our businesses, we continue to take a close interest in justice and security cooperation, in fisheries, in transport connectivity, and of course, data exchange. Both sides now have a fair idea of where there is clear convergence uh, or divergence, as the case may be, between our respective positions. Progress has uh, been much slower in truth than we had hoped. The restrictions of COVID-19 uh, and, ta and taking meetings by video conference are part of the reason for this, but they're not actually the fundamental reason in my view. The UK's level of ambition is much lower than the EU's and fundamental differences remain between the two sides on some of the most important issues. These include uh, level playing field provisions uh, and overarching governance uh, uh, for any new arrangements that may be put in place, uh, as well as, of course, fisheries, uh, which was always understood uh, to be part of an overall deal uh, linked to um, uh, trying to put together a, a, a new uh, trading deal and trading conditions between the EU and the UK. Two further negotiating rounds will take place in the coming weeks, starting next week on Monday. Uh, Michel Barnier uh, has been very clear uh, that we need to see much better engagement from the UK in these rounds if we're going to make progress. Uh, June will be a key moment. A, a high level conference, um, sorry, at a high level conference, the EU and the UK will jointly consider the progress made uh, at that point uh, and what it means for the period ahead. The need uh, the end of June uh, is also the last point at which the Joint Committee can decide to extend the transition period. Uh, this would have to be uh, a decision made by the EU and the UK jointly. 
the UK government continues to say very clearly, both publicly and privately, that they will not agree to an extension. Uh, this is the reality uh, that must be factored in, both for the future relationship negotiation and preparing for the end of transition. Uh, a second separate but related stream of work is the implementation of the withdrawal agreement and the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland. Implementation uh, is vital as the protocol underpins uh, a more permanent set of arrangements to address the challenges of Brexit on the island of Ireland. Uh, and I think we're all familiar with those debates because we spent two years uh, discussing them uh, in the build up to agreement uh, finally. Ireland has attended and participated in the recent meetings of the Joint and the Specialised Committees. Uh, these meetings have considered uh, the preparatory work needed for a number of decisions the Joint Committee must take under the protocol and the range of work that the UK needs uh, to take forward to implement the protocol in full. Together with the EU, uh, we have strongly underlined with the UK how important it is that the uh, UK now makes clear, detailed, uh, progress on implementation of the protocol. Implementation of the protocol will mean some changes and we know that. Uh, we're all aware that this is complex work requiring run-in time uh, and engagement with stakeholders to ensure the protocol works for Northern Ireland and for the all-island economy as a whole. We welcome the UK's continued commitment to fully implement the protocol and they have given that commitment uh, in the specialised committee which is welcome. Um, we hope to see further, more detailed engagement from the UK at the upcoming meetings of the Specialised Committee and the Joint Committees in the weeks ahead. Uh, I would agree with Michel Barnier's view that uh, faithful and effective implementation of the withdrawal agreement is absolutely central uh, to, to the progress of the negotiations more generally. I think it's also a really important act of good faith. The third stream uh, of ongoing work uh, is on preparedness for the future, whatever that may hold, uh, to, uh, uh, to assist citizens and businesses in getting ready uh, for the new realities post-transition. The withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol ensures uh, that we are uh, no longer face, faced with a no-deal Brexit and the challenges that that brings. However, Brexit represents a substantive cha change to our relationship with our closest neighbour it will fundamentally affect how we do business together across so many areas. The UK has left the EU. Uh, at the end of the transition period, the UK will leave the customs union and the single market. Uh, even the best possible FTA between the EU and the UK will impact supply chains and trade flows and result in checks and controls in both directions uh, to EU-UK trade. With less than seven months to the end of transition, we remain committed to doing everything in our power to ensure that citizens and businesses are as ready as they can be for the end of that transition and the change that it's going to bring. We continue to develop the infrastructure and systems at our ports and our airports. We're working with our partners and the Commission to ensure the UK land bridge remains an efficient route to market to and from Ireland. Brexit comes. Uh, at a time when businesses are already under enormous pressure in the face of the challenges brought by COVID-19. Brexit preparation will necessarily be part of a wider business recovery agenda linked to COVID-19. Uh, and we will look at how best business supports can be deployed in support of the Brexit challenges on top of everything else. There will be a lot of uncertainty in the months ahead. That's about the only certainty we have. Um, Ireland's best interests will continue to be served by us playing our part as a member of the EU27, and that we will do. So in conclusion, uh, in the short term, uh, our response to the COVID-19 emergency will dominate the agenda for some time to come for understandable reasons. But our recovery in a post-coronavirus world uh, will be the defining issue for the union uh, over the lifetime uh, of every government in every member state right now. The path ahead is not clear. This is a profound shock that has a direct impact on the life of every European. Even after the virus is defeated, uh, its aftershocks and the new constraints it imposes will define what member states and the union do, arguably for the next decade. 
the emergency and recovery will change politics, will change economies and societies across Europe. Citizens' attitudes will also change uh, their views on the state and the proper organization of, of society, their views on how they work, where they work, and how they interact with colleagues will all be colored uh, by this virus. The future role and relevance of the EU will be decided both by how it performs during this crisis and by how it facilitates a recovery and a renewal in many ways uh, in terms of aspirations for the future. Ireland will have to be agile and adapt to the changed political and policy environment, and we will be. Existing alliances have shifted and will continue to do so. Solidarity with fellow member states will be sought and expected. A greater EU resilience and autonomy in strategic supply chains will be inevitable now. Brexit negotiations will be influenced by the impact of the crisis both in the EU and in the UK. Now and in the coming months, we must take a critical look at the assumptions behind our existing positions on the dominant EU issues and assess how they might be impacted by COVID-19. If they remain fit for purpose and if not, how they should change and how we should shape the future. Our discussion here is part of that critical examination. And I'd like to thank the IAEA once again for their work and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Tanish, to, for that um, the detailed, comprehensive um, overview um, uh, of our uh, relationship within the, the, the European Union and the challenges that we face. Uh, we'll take questions as they, the, as they come uh, to us on the Q&A um, uh, function, but just uh, maybe just to get the ball uh, rolling, uh, Tanish, uh, just when you were concluding there, you spoke about the future role and relevance of the EU will be decided. Uh, but by how it performs during this crisis and by how it facilitates uh, the recovery. And in your earlier remarks, or earlier on in your remarks, you spoke about all the things and the many uh, initiatives that the EU has undertaken. I suppose the question is, has it done enough and is it doing enough? Uh, and I suppose the underlying concern being has permanent damage, however undeserved it might be, given all that has been done, has, uh, has, has, has there been permanent damage done, particularly uh, in, in countries like um, uh, Italy and Spain, obviously, which have been particularly affected by the by the by the terrors of the virus. Yeah, I mean, I think you you know the the honest answer, I suppose, in um in a uh, in an emergency management environment, which is what this is, uh, is that the state can never do enough, uh, and a union like the European Union can never do enough because people will always want more supports. Um, and I think it's probably too early to judge fully um, um, the, the response of, of the EU in terms of the immediate response to a crisis that we were all struggling to understand at the time. Uh, and now, as we know more about it and have had some time to plan for the future, how the European Union is uh, supporting countries uh, in their recovery processes. Uh, I mean, undoubtedly, mistakes have been made. Uh, the pace of of coordination um, uh, for for some countries um, was was too slow. Um, the you know the 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 capacity to source um, medical equipment, ventilators, PPE uh, for some states uh, they were left vulnerable. Uh, and you know undoubtedly, I think if we were to learn lessons from that, and we will. Uh, should this happen in the future, I hope there will be a more centralized procurement process that can um, that can hold uh, stock uh, in a way that uh, that ensures that that EU member states have access to uh, to vital equipment uh, in a more timely manner, rather than than effectively competing with each other on international markets. But you know, I would be very slow to blame the European Union and its institutions for that. I mean, I think the extent of the challenge here was an extraordinary one. Uh, and we are not a United States of Europe uh, that has essential control around all competency. Um, and member states effectively uh, took matters into their own hands in many areas in terms of managing restrictions, closing borders, um, and uh, focusing on the public health of their own citizens uh, in a way that the European Union could only <coughs> 
assist and support on uh, and certainly not uh, direct a response uh, within individual uh, countries on. So, you know, <clears throat> I think since the initial reaction to this where, you know, I think some member states would have liked to have seen more solidarity earlier on, um, I think the EU has responded in a very comprehensive way since that time uh, in terms of financial support packages, uh, in terms of, uh, of giving public health advice to member states who are seeking it, uh, and trying to ensure that member states learn from each other in terms of mistakes that have been made, uh, trying to make sure that our single market remains functional and, and open um, uh, uh, through um, a period when many borders were effectively closed. Um, so, you know, I think the European Union collectively has done a lot of good things here. Um, and I think that needs to be recognized and spoken about um, because uh, often uh, at a time of crisis, you know, the positive response is taken for granted. Uh, and then when something is missed, uh, that becomes the focal point of all attention and coverage. Uh, and I think, you know, that would be an unfair way to, uh, to look at, at this pandemic and how the European Union as a collective has responded to it, because member states have to take responsibility individually themselves in terms of how, the, uh, of how they've responded. And of course, the European institutions and the collective EU response needs to be fully scrutinized as well as we go so that we learn lessons from the mistakes that have been made. I mean, everyone's made mistakes, um, but I think, um, uh, you know, I think we have learned lessons and learned quickly from those lessons. Um, and, um, uh, and as a result, many people are alive today who otherwise wouldn't be. Uh, and we, we are now all putting together effectively economic recovery plans uh, and societal recovery plans uh, as we plan to ease out of uh, the extraordinary restrictions that have been imposed on our citizens uh, in a way that hopefully can avoid a second wave uh, of the spread of this virus across the European Union. Um, the other thing I think is important is that the EU, given the wealth that we have, does have to be a global leader here too. Uh, and while we talk about uh, sourcing ventilators and so on, uh, thousands of them in some cases, uh, there are many parts of the world uh, with much, much bigger populations than what we have uh, that simply do not have health infrastructure uh, that, that has the capacity to be able to respond. Uh, and we do need to, to restructure our development partnerships uh, and our financial support uh, in a way that can help those countries to cope. Uh, thank you, Tanishta. Just uh, some questions coming in now uh, from uh, Owen Lewis of our, um, who's the chair of the IAEA Climate Group, and maybe just to, uh, to move away from, uh, directly from uh, um, the pandemic, perhaps, but related to it, obviously, and indeed Brexit. He wants to know what will be the significance of the European Green Deal in the recovery process? Yeah, I mean, look, that's, that's a big focus uh, for us uh, in the context of putting a new government together as well. Um, you know, as, uh, as some people might know, um, you know, the formal negotiation process between Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil and the Greens began yesterday. Um, and um, um, certainly there is an ambition as we rebuild an economy. Uh, we, we ensure that that new economy, if you like, is shaped by by our commitments uh, uh, around climate action and the obligations that we have there and the commitments we've made. So we are supportive of the new Green Deal. Um, that means an increased level of ambition in terms of emissions reductions, but it also means uh, an increased level of ambition in terms of the opportunities that are there uh, to build industries uh, and businesses around um, uh, the, the technology and the innovation uh, and the capital that is available uh, for um, uh, a green economy. Um, so uh, it is, I mean, obviously the biggest challenge of the next government, whoever it makes that up, uh, is going to be uh, an economic recovery plan to get people back to work. I mean, we have over a million people in Ireland today who are relying almost entirely on the state for their income. Uh, we have over 800,000 people uh, unemployed. Uh, we need to get those people back to work. But we also, I think, need to, um, to look at the lessons learned during this uh, emergency uh, in terms of things like flexible work, um, things like people being able to work from home. Um, and we've, we've got to plan 
a new economic growth model, uh, perhaps through a different lens um, that isn't just sustainable from an economic perspective and from a fiscal perspective, but is also sustainable from a climate and environmental perspective. And I think this crisis in some ways offers us the opportunity to try and do that. Uh, and I well, hopefully will be part of a government that, um, uh, that, is, that is focused on doing that. So I know Owen would be very interested in that conversation and I'd, I'd happily talk to him about it um, um, you know, as we try to put a, a program for government together that's credible but also very ambitious uh, on that agenda. Just a question here from Donald uh, Donovan, a former IMF um, um, colleague and IEA Life member. He says, as we know, northern EU countries opposing the issuance of corona bonds have argued that a major expansion of EU level taxation powers is required first. Ireland has supported the call for corona bonds, but has generally resisted greater EU involvement in taxation matters. Do you have any difficulty in reconciling these two positions? I, I don't. Is the straight answer? You know, uh, I, I think um, you know we we felt that um, that solidarity was and is hugely important uh, when tens of thousands of people are dying uh, in countries in the European Union. Uh, we uh, we felt that it was really important to try to ensure that there was um, solidarity in terms of the financial supports um, that countries will need uh, to rebuild um, uh, societies and economies um, and recover from the scars uh, of this um, of this pandemic. Um, and um, and that is why we signed the letter with with eight countries uh, for. Uh, effectively a solidarity bond stroke uh, coronavirus uh, bond. Um, that hasn't been agreed, of course. Uh, there has been a different support package uh, with a slightly different emphasis uh, uh, in terms of, um, uh, of supports, but certainly uh, that, that new package of supports will allow countries to borrow at very low interest rates, um, uh, uh, and that's going to be needed. Um, the, you know, as I said earlier in my speech, the um, uh, the fiscal rules, if you like, uh, are going to show very significant flexibility, recognizing the reality of where countries are. Uh, Ireland may well run a deficit of over 20 billion euros this year. We were expecting to run a surplus of well over 2 billion. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing unemployment levels well above 20%. Um, you know, these are figures that, you know, are quite extraordinary. Um, you know, we, we think our, our economy could shrink by you know, by 10% this year, you know, we were, we were looking at a no deal Brexit worst case scenario impact on the economy uh, of um, reducing growth over the next 10 years by about 7%. Um, so just to put it into context, um, uh, the, the extent of the change and the stress that that's going to put on our economy uh, and on our people. Um, so uh, I think that um, uh, we will need solidarity and we're getting it. Uh, in terms of financial support packages from EU institutions. But I think we'll also need the flexibility as countries to be able to design an economic model that can create, com create a, competitive, a competitive, innovative environment uh, for an economy to grow again. And, and having um, uh, the capacity to make decisions on taxation uh, that are transparent uh, and accountable uh, is an important part of that fiscal toolbox, if you like, for countries like Ireland and others. Uh, and that's why I think, you know, maintaining the autonomy of decision making around taxation to the extent that it's there at the moment, it's not entirely there, um, but to the extent that it's there at the moment, uh, I think is, uh, is an, import of, an important part of Ireland's uh, economic thinking uh, in the context of the recovery across the EU. And by the way, we're not alone on that. Um, and um, uh, uh, and I think we'll continue to make that argument. Thank you, Tanish. Uh, just a question here from Paddy Smith, um, formerly a Brussels correspondent, now I think Dublin based for the Irish Times. He says uh, there has been a disappointment at the early e uh, EU response, uh, but in part from ignorance that health is not a competence. Uh, does the government support the creation of such a competence in the context of the conference and the future of the EU, uh, particularly perhaps in the area of pandemic uh, management? Um, um, maybe you'd have a chance to address that, Donisha. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I um, 
Like, I think in an emergency situation like this, you will get member states taking action to protect their own citizens, uh, particularly when you have a pandemic that is spreading at a different pace in different countries. Um, and, you know, that was a big part of what happened here. You know, this in many ways started in Italy uh, and then spread rapidly across the EU, but different countries were dealing with a different level of, of infection and spread, uh, and so implemented uh, uh, their own national uh, decisions around health. I mean, obviously, changing competence may involve changing treaties, which, which isn't a straightforward process from an Irish perspective. Um, and um, so, I mean, I think, I think we can have a lot of coordination in relation to, uh, to how an, the EU would respond in the future. Uh, to a second wave of COVID-19 or to another similar health crisis. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll have learned an awful lot of lessons in terms of coordination um, and more self-reliance within the EU in terms of everything from you know, medical equipment to PPE to ventilators and so on. Um, but the idea that member states would uh, be keen to hand over a competence in the health space um, to EU institutions, I think that's unlikely to happen. In fact, I think the, the response to the pandemic is likely to mean that that's less likely rather than more likely. Um, but that doesn't mean that countries won't be open to more central coordination. Uh, because, I mean, if you take Ireland, for example, it doesn't make sense for a country of our size to look to be self-sufficient in everything. Uh, but it certainly does make sense for 450 million people in the EU to look to be self-sufficient in terms of sourcing capacity. Um, uh, and so there are things we need to do collectively where we, treat it, uh, where we treat ourselves as a single market, which is what we are. Uh, but there, there's also a competence issue in terms of being able to make emergency decisions to protect our own citizens. Um, and I, that's why I don't think there's likely to be a shift in competence here, but I think there is likely to be a focus on more coordination. Um, and maybe just broadening it out a little bit, Tomsch, to beyond the, the pandemic itself, um, is the EU at its, at its limits uh, in terms of what is possible as a union at this time? I mean, I'm going beyond the pandemic now. Um, uh, we have, as, as Paddy said, the Future of Europe initiative beginning in the autumn, and realistically, can we still harbour the ambition for an even stronger and more integrated union? Well, I think it depends what people mean by that. You know, I mean, uh, I think uh, in some areas, more integration doesn't make sense. You know, I mean, I, I, I um, you know, I'm not a federalist when it comes to the European Union. Some people are. Uh, and like that's that's an ongoing debate that I that I'm in and out of. And I kind of get persuaded by different arguments at different times. But I think, you know, I think the European Union is a is a union of sovereign states that agree to pool competence in certain areas when it makes sense to do so. Um, uh, and I think that's the way it's gonna stay. Um, but I do think we need more integration in certain areas. So, you know, the, um, the single market, particularly single market for services uh, is, is far from complete. Uh, and I think we have a lot of very good work to do in that area, particularly as we all go through the process of economic recovery. I think it would be very helpful uh, to focus on what we can do to ensure that the single market is functioning better. I mean, it functions pretty well for goods. Uh, it's only about 30% complete for services. Uh, I, I think about financial services, insurance, um, and so many different other areas where I think um, uh, a, a better functioning, more streamlined single market would be beneficial for everybody, uh, particularly for Ireland. So in that sense, I think more integration uh, is necessary. Uh, in terms of ensuring the functioning of a single market. I think more integration, if you like, in terms of decision-making on foreign policy uh, would also be helpful uh, in the context of our relationship with Africa, for example, um, which I think is going to be a hugely important and dynamic one uh, over the next 10 or 20 years as that population, as that continent is transformed by, a, uh, by an extra billion people. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, um, when you say, is the EU at its limits in terms of ambition? I really hope not, because if you, if you stop asking questions, if you stop asking how can we, more, we be more ambitious, what do we need to do next? Uh, if there aren't those kind of ambitious drivers behind a union, 
then things tend to uh, stagnate and get stale. Uh, and we can never allow that in the European Union. It's always been a union based on ambition, improving the quality of life of everybody in the union, uh, protecting a peace project, facilitating uh, wealth creation and trade. And I think increasingly now asking ourselves the question, how can we be the most powerful voice for multilateralism internationally uh, and impact on um, uh, providing a, a stabilizing influence uh, as well as trade opportunities, as well as development opportunities in other parts of the world. So I think the European Union needs to be very ambitious, but that doesn't mean we don't have real problems. We do. Um, and, you know, whether it's issues around uh, the rule of law and how it's implemented, um, whether it's uh, debates on migration, for example, which is a hugely divisive debate still within the European Union, uh, whether it's how we respond to conflicts in other parts of the world, where often the EU offers a lot of money, uh, but doesn't have the capacity to impact on political decision making sometimes. Um, I think these are questions that we have to ask ourselves. But um, um, so it really depends what you mean by, by more, more integration within the European Union. But I, I think I've given a sense of, uh, uh, you know, of the areas where I certainly I believe we need, uh, we need more ambition. Uh, whether that's integration or not uh, is, um, uh, depends on how you perceive it. Honestly, we'll, we'll come to questions in relation to Brexit and I'm going to group them because there's quite a few of them, but just one or two more questions uh, on, on, um, uh, on relation to Brexit, perhaps. Uh, one we have here from William Lavelle of the Irish Whiskey Association. He wants to know what does uh, the Tánaiste see as the next steps in seeking to de-escalate EU-US trade tensions and to potentially uh, secure the removal of tariffs imposed over the past uh, two years and avoid further tariffs indeed. Yeah, a man who's looking to sell more whiskey there, by the sounds of things. Yeah, he's, got, uh, he's got a view here, yeah. So, but anyway, I, I, I should, uh, um, yeah, I, and, uh, yeah, and, you know, and rightly so. The, the, um, yeah, look, I mean, we're, um, I think we're lucky here to have, to have Phil, Phil Hogan in the, in the trade brief uh, in the European Commission. I think he's, under, he's someone who understands uh, the US as well as the EU. Uh, and I know that, um, um, that he wants to try to, um, find a way of removing some of the political barriers there to improving the trade relationship uh, between the EU and the US. I mean, in my view, and I think this is a, a very Irish government view, uh, I mean, if you remember the last time we had the EU presidency, um, we, we worked hard to advance uh, a transatlantic trade and investment partnership at that time uh, for understandable political reasons um, and presidential cycles and so on, that that essentially fell apart. Uh, there has been, uh, in my view, unwelcome tension uh, between the US and the EU uh, from a trade perspective. Uh, and I think we need to work to change that um, because uh, I think it makes an awful lot of sense for the EU and the US, quite frankly, uh, to, to aspire to having a much more streamlined um, uh, trading relationship with far less barriers to trade uh, in terms of quotas and tariffs uh, 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 on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and certainly from an Irish perspective, I think we should be working towards that. And, you know, with an Irish commissioner for trade, uh, we, uh, we can play, I think, quite a significant role um, uh, in succeeding in that regard. Um, very good. Um, just a question here from um, Trevor Boland. Do you think the EU is moving too slowly, both in terms of COVID and agreeing the future MFF 2021-2027, uh, particularly in terms of CAP uh, budget post-2020? He says CAP beneficiaries do not know for certain a large proportion of their income post-2020, and it makes budgeting, financial planning, and succession planning more difficult without this certainty. Um. It does, but I mean, you know, trying to get a new MFF agreed has become even more difficult because of COVID-19, because, you know, there's a, there is a view, and I think it's a correct view, um, that we need to now look at all of the tools that we have, financial tools uh, and economic tools, through the, the lens of how do, we, how do we facilitate a sustainable recovery in a post-COVID environment? Because you know, if you look at the numbers in terms of unemployment, uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, growth rates, um, uh, in terms of deficits, uh, in terms of the borrowing capacity of countries, 
um, you know, this is an extraordinary shock to the system uh, that at the moment the EU is trying to grapple with. And so we're going to have to look at how we use the MFF um, uh, uh, as a counterbalance to the, the, the disruption of COVID-19, uh, how we shape and use a recovery fund also, uh, and how, of course, the EU institutions like the European Central Bank um, uh, and investment funds and so on uh, can be used also in this regard. So um, I can understand why there is uh, or has been a delay in the process because we're effectively having to rethink the MFF somewhat uh, through a different lens. Um, that being said, from an Irish perspective, of course, uh, the cap is, uh, is a hugely important part of the MFF for us. Uh, uh, the vast majority of the funds that we draw down into Ireland uh, uh, from, from the EU are through the Common Agricultural Policy uh, and, and, of course, agriculture. And the food industry more generally is such an important part of our uh, economy and will be uh, as we try to recover uh, from this uh, COVID disruption as well. So I think it is going to take a bit more time. Um, our focus will be to try to protect the CAP fund um, uh, as well as recognizing that the MFF has to be reshaped uh, for the economic challenges of COVID. Uh, and I think that is going to take a bit of time, uh, even though people want certainty as soon as possible. Okay, Tom, so maybe we move on to some Brexit-related questions now. Um, there's one here from um, uh, Lisa Clare from Queen's University, Belfast. She says, as countries across the EU move into the next stage of uh, coronavirus policy responses, how important will North-South cooperation be on the island of Ireland to enable contact tracing and community testing? And what impact will the outcome of the UK-EU negotiations have on any cooperative effort? Gosh. Um that's the question that has a lot of strings attached to it. Um, and um, uh, I'm just anxious that I, that I answer other questions as well. But let me just say... Do you want me to group a few more questions? Well, well, there's a lot of questions in that that I think other people might have as well. It just, I mean, first of all, like North-South cooperation is really important in the context of, of, of the COVID challenge. Um, and just to reassure people, I mean, we have... Uh, every two weeks, we have a long video conference call that uh, on our side has, has myself and Simon Harris, um, and um, on the, uh, the Northern Ireland and the British side, uh, the Secretary of State, Brandon Lewis, uh, the First and Deputy First Minister, and Robin Swan, the Health Minister as well. So, you know, there is a lot of discussion back and forth uh, on uh, the need for North-South cooperation, understanding what others are doing, I know there's been some concern that you know the Irish government have announced things without giving the heads up first to the executive. Um, we would certainly have tried to have give the uh, to have given the heads up, but sometimes we can't give all of the detail because often these things are announced immediately after the cabinet, uh, i.e., the Irish government, has been given the details. So we can't inform the executive before we get approval from our own cabinet. So there are systems, and there have been some issues there, undoubtedly. Um, there are also issues in terms of uh, different uh, medical advice, if you like, in terms of the effectiveness of um, uh, expanding testing into the community, uh, contact tracing on the back of that, trying to essentially follow outbreaks of the virus and clusters where and when they happen, to be able to put those fires out through uh, putting people into, into self-isolation. Uh, and so if we have different approaches in terms of how this virus and its spread is managed on both sides of the border, then that does create challenges in terms of the, you know, the, the timelines around easing of restrictions if the virus is behaving differently in, in two jurisdictions. Um, and we're trying to overcome those challenges as best we can. Uh, but it, I mean, it certainly has put tensions uh, uh, in place within the executive, and people will recall the tension around, you know, school closures in Northern Ireland and the timing of that versus the decisions we made south of the border. We're trying to make sure that there's not a repeat of those kind of tensions. And obviously, we don't want to have some kind of perverse incentive to uh, to encourage people from Northern Ireland to travel south across the border to access services or retail outlets, or vice versa, for that matter. Uh, in a way that actually could contribute to the spread of the virus on a cross-border basis. Um, so, like, we'll continue to try to, um, to coordinate a north-south response as best we can. 
recognizing the fact that our government and the executive in Northern Ireland are getting their public health advice from two different chief medical officers. Uh, and, uh, and we have to recognize and respect that, but at the same time, try to coordinate as best we can in all island response, recognizing that there are two jurisdictions. But you know, the one thing we know we can't do is we can't impose border checks or border restrictions between North and South. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have to try to coordinate this at a political level, uh, which is why we spend so much time talking to each other via video conferencing, uh, and we'll continue to do that. Um, uh, and how that's linked then to, to Brexit? Well, um, I mean, I suppose there is a connection between the two, even though they're two separate issues. Uh, but I think uh, what's needed in terms of coordination on Brexit is the implementation of the protocol on Northern Ireland, uh, because uh, regardless of what happens on trade negotiations, that protocol needs to be implemented. So if, and I really hope this doesn't happen, but if there is not a deal uh, on a free trade agreement between the EU and the UK before the end of the year, we still need the Irish protocol or the Northern Irish protocol fully implemented uh, so that we can trade under WTO rules effectively, which is the default position, uh, in a way that protects the integ integrity of the EU single market, in a way that, that, that protects an all-island economy, and in a way that follows through on the commitments of everybody to ensure that there would be no border infrastructure on the island of Ireland. Uh, and therefore, that requires some level of checks on goods coming from GB into Northern Ireland, which is what's agreed in that protocol, which involves infrastructure in ports like Larn and Belfast. Uh, and we need to see that progressing um, um, in the weeks ahead. Um, and so, I, you know, the British government have made it clear in the specialized committee meetings that we've had that they are fully committed to implementing the protocol and the obligations that they've taken on uh, in that protocol. But we do need to see the sort of the practical rollout of those commitments because we know how long it takes to put infrastructure in place to prepare for a new trading environment between these islands because we've done it in Dublin Port and in Ross Lair Port. It's expensive and it takes time and it involves human resources uh, uh, as well as as well as as well as other you know physical infrastructure. Uh, and um, you know, I think it would be very reassuring if we could see that infrastructure taking shape uh, so that the protocol uh, can be in place for full implementation by the end of the year. Of course, we want to have an outcome here that allows for a free trade agreement along with the level playing field issues agreed and the fisheries issues agreed and a governance structure agreed and so on to ensure that any checks between GB and Northern Ireland would be uh, limited to, uh, uh, to the greatest extent possible. Uh, and having a positive free trade agreement without tariffs, uh, without quotas, uh, uh, would make that uh, as streamlined as we'd all like to make it to be. Thank you, Panishta. Just uh, maybe I'll, I'll group a few questions here, uh, again, all related to um, uh, Brexit from um, Mario Harron from the Irish Times. How does the Tonish to think the UK can be persuaded to extend the negotiating period for Brexit trade talks? Um, a second one here from Shona Murray from Euronews. She says the UK says its high its, its priority is to leave the UK as a quote fully autonomous coastal state unquote and will not agree to common or EU determined level playing field standards or on, on the environment, tax, labour markets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is there any way around this? so that the UK doesn't feel like they're a rule taker. And uh, let me just see yeah, one final one here from Aidan uh, Corfrey in the Business Post. He says, regarding the protocol of Northern Ireland agreed between the UK and the EU, does the Polish interpret this as giving the EU the right to have a permanent presence in Northern Ireland in order to monitor checks being carried out by British customs and veterinary staff? Yeah, I mean, I mean, let me deal with the last question first, and then I'll I'll deal with uh, um, um, Shona's and and Marie's as well. I mean, you know, there has been this um, uh, political discussion now uh, in recent weeks on whether or not there would be an EU office facilitated in Belfast or in Northern Ireland in the context of the um, uh, the protocol. I mean, certainly. You know, my understanding was that this was a non-issue um, uh, when we were negotiating that uh, that protocol. Um, and in the protocol, it's 
it, it's quite clear that it'll be the UK implementing the arrangements um, within the UK, of course, uh, and providing the checks and the um, uh, in the ports and so on, but that the EU would have a presence there. Uh, and the whole point of that was to provide reassurance, uh, not just to Ireland, uh, but to the EU more generally, that um, that the EU's single market and its integrity wasn't being undermined or compromised. In other words, there, you know, some across the EU have a concern that Northern Ireland becomes a sort of an unguarded backdoor for goods to come into the single market through the Republic of Ireland. And the protocol has to deal with that issue comprehensively, and it does. Um, but it'll be the UK authorities that will be managing that. Um, but the EU would have a presence there, which I think is in the interest of both sides, to provide the reassurance needed that the protocol is working. It's working for the UK, it's working for Ireland, and it's working for the EU and its single market. Because if you make an absolute commitment, as we have, that there will not be any checks uh, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, then you have to provide checks somewhere to ensure that you know what's coming in potentially to the single market through Northern Ireland. And that, is, that, is, that, that was the whole dilemma that the Irish Protocol deals with. Uh, and so, um, you know, the assumption was always there, I think, on the EU side, that that would mean having a relatively small office with technocrats from the EU uh, uh, who would understand how, you know, custom systems and SBS checks work, and they would just be there as a presence uh, to be able to reassure the EU side that this was functioning well. Um, unfortunately, I think some in the UK has seen the, uh, uh, have some in the UK have seen the request for an EU office in Belfast as a sort of a, uh, a compromising of sovereignty uh, for the UK, uh, and that this is oversight uh, as opposed to simply having a presence. And I don't think that's the intention. Um, uh, but look, you know, uh, I think we need to make sure we don't have a falling out over this issue because we've got to resolve a lot of things. Um, and um, uh, you know, I think we can find ways through sensible negotiation of taking the heat out of this political debate. And trying to, uh, and agreeing practical ways of ensuring that the EU can provide reassurance uh, and have some presence uh, to be able to uh, uh, to observe the functioning of the protocol in the way that it needs to operate. And really, that's all it is. Um, the um, um, uh, Shona's comments in relation to yeah, the I mean, the UK's ambitions, talking about the UK being fully autonomous. Uh, protecting sovereignty, you know, I, I, I can, you know, I, I, I get that language. Um, that is what has driven Brexit uh, in many ways for the last number of years, uh, breaking free from the European Union uh, and Britain essentially reforging its place uh, internationally in the world, not being a rule taker any longer, you know, and that's all, you know, uh, that's fine from a, um, um, a political narrative perspective, but if there's going to be a trade deal between the UK and the EU um, that doesn't involve any tariffs or any quotas, uh, and that involves essentially uh, barrier-free access uh, for the UK and its industries into uh, the EU single market in the future, uh, then, you know, there is a there is a negotiation where both sides have interests here. Uh, you can't have uh, quota-free, tariff-free trade unless there's a level playing field. You know, there, there, there is just no way that the EU can have a situation where uh, the UK essentially does its own thing on regulation uh, and on state supports uh, and on competition law and so on uh, to derive competitive advantage for their companies and then expects that they will get um, barrier-free access into the EU single market, uh, having derived that competitive advantage. You know, I mean, I, the EU c can just never facilitate that. Uh, and why would they? Uh, and so really all the EU is looking for here is to ensure that if we have, which is what we all want, uh, tariff-free and quota-free trade between the UK and the EU, which I think would benefit everybody, particularly Ireland, then we have to make sure that everybody is essentially operating to the same standards and the same business environment uh, around cost base, uh, around everything from uh, workers' rights to environmental standards to consumer protection uh, to uh, state aid and so on. Um, and um, so, 
you know, the question is, like, how do we describe this? Um, how do we make this politically acceptable for the British government, while at the same time ensuring that it works in practice in a way that is acceptable to the EU and its member states, where, where nobody is deriving a competitive advantage versus each other if we're going to have a free trade relationship with each other. Um, and, um, you know, this is essentially the crux of the issue. Um, and, uh, and if we can't resolve it, there's not going to be a deal. I mean, that's my assessment. Um, and so at the moment, the UK's approach is that they want to do sectoral deals in certain areas uh, and limiting those areas to, to what's important in terms of trying to get a deal for the UK before the end of the year. Uh, the EU is saying, well, no, we can't work on that basis. We need an overarching agreement here that involves a number of things at the same time because they're interconnected. Um, and if we can't do that, well, then we can't sign up to a deal. Um, and protect the integrity of our own single market and our member states' interests. Um, and that is why the two rounds of negotiations to date have really got nowhere, uh, because the approach and the outcome that both sides are looking for at the moment are quite different. Uh, and you know, at a bare minimum, I think what the EU needs is an understanding and an agreement around the level playing field issues, whatever we decide to call them politically, uh, we need agreement around a governance structure that can ensure that that agreement is essentially monitored and enforceable and we can deal with disputes and so on in the future. Um, uh, we need to get a deal on fishing uh, because that is linked to trade in the future. Uh, and that, was, that, that has always been the understanding in the political declaration uh, in the past and in the negotiations and the build up to agreement on that political declaration. It's always been the understanding. Uh, and then we have, have areas like security and policing and cooperation and data and so on, which I think are also areas that need to be part of an overall agreement. And, um, uh, and so until the two negotiating sides can agree a shared outcome that they're trying to achieve, uh, I think it's going to be very difficult to see progress uh, in this negotiation in terms of a future relationship. Uh, and that's why, of course, we're so adamant that that in the absence of that progress, we do need to make progress on the implementation of, of what has already been agreed in the withdrawal agreement and the Irish protocol to protect what, what we know we need to protect around an absence of border infrastructure, uh, Ireland's place in the EU single market and its integrity, and of course our relationship north and south and our relationship with the UK, which is so important to Ireland, whether they're in or out of the European Union for the future. Um, so how do we persuade uh, Mary's question, which I think is a very fair question, given the complexity of what we're trying to deal with here, given the added complications, and there are many as a result of COVID-19, uh, it surely makes sense uh, for us to, um, to seek a bit more time uh, to navigate our way through these very, very difficult waters um, uh, in the months ahead so that we can get a good outcome for everybody, the UK and the EU. Um, and, you know, I think anybody looking at this from the outside uh, could only conclude that it makes sense to look for more time to get a sensible outcome uh, and to find a way forward. Um, um, but the British government has, has decided that that's not what they want. And they've made that very clear both publicly and privately. Um, so I wouldn't be raising expectation around the British government agreeing to seeking more time. Um, and if we're going to have any chance of persuading them to seek more time, I think we need to be careful how we do that, because demanding it from them, almost as a concession to the EU, is certainly not the way to do it. Uh, and I think uh, if there's to be a request for more time, it either needs to come jointly from both negotiating teams uh, to, uh, uh, in the interests of both uh, the EU and the UK, or it needs to come from the UK, um, framed uh, in a narrative that, um, uh, that is about trying to put a comprehensive trade deal in place that's good for Britain and therefore recognising that COVID-19 has made what was already a very, very difficult timeline uh, to get agreement on uh, virtually impossible. Uh, and look, I hope people will come to that conclusion, but I, I don't, um, I'm not optimistic that that's what will happen. Uh, I think instead we're likely to see people holding their positions on, on transition 
uh, us moving through through and past the deadline of the end of June, uh, and then having um, potentially a a very very difficult crisis point in Brexit yet again in the autumn as we try to find a way forward uh, that can avoid the kind of cliff edge uh, trade impact uh, of uh, of a no uh, no trade deal Brexit if you want to call it that uh, before the end of transition. Sorry, that was a very long answer, but they, they, they're, they're important issues. Thank you very much, Tanish. We're at the, the limits of uh, the time available. Um, just wanted to draw to a conclusion and just to apologise to those people for whom we had not the opportunity to uh, reach in their questions, although I think um, most of the issues of concern were covered in your, in your general remarks or, 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 or in other answers to questions. But just to say um, uh, thank you indeed for the remarks and as I say taking the time out to be with us today. Appreciate, of course, that there's a lot more going on out there than the IAEA, uh, but taking the time out from your indeed busy schedule is warmly appreciated. And indeed, at any normal time, uh, the European and international agenda is full of challenge. But I suppose COVID and Brexit together involve immediate challenges of a unique and critical nature. We wish you, Thonishta, and all involved here in Ireland and throughout the EU every success in addressing uh, these pressing challenges. And we hope that by uh, Europe Day 2021, we will see uh, renewed strength, hope, and optimism and brighter times around for everybody. In the meantime, thank you again, Tanishta, and uh, to all of you who have joined us today, all 400 of you plus, uh, it's been a privilege uh, hosting you, Tanishta, and all our guests. We look forward to seeing you on a future occasion with the IAEA. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Stay safe. <laughs>